Following chapter 1, which you probably don't need for this one, we turn heads by examining neural language models, building up to what's called a recurrent neural network. Remember that what we're trying to build is a language model. The idea was that if I wanted to have some model that can generate text, I model it as next word prediction, which means that my model takes in some previous words and a next word and outputs the probability that the next word appears given the previous words. The goal by the end of the video is to convince you that a logical idea is to use a neural network to compute this probability. In the last video, the way I got this probability was by collecting a lot of text and counting the number of times the sequence appeared in that text, dividing by the number of times the context appears. We call this an n-gram language model. A big issue that neural networks try to fix is when the context just doesn't appear. And this sort of is the main strength of neural networks. If I show the network a bunch of similar examples, it's able to learn from that data. Let's talk about how this works. Stepping back, an artificial neural network is simply made to predict some output given an input. Typically, these inputs and outputs are vectors. So in this example, I'm predicting the digit of a handwritten image. The way I construct this input is by taking the pixel values and then converting them to a super long vector. But if I'm trying to create a language model from a neural network, it's not actually that clear what I should even be inputting. One of the earliest language models came from a paper by Joshua Bengio, one of the pioneers of deep learning. This method worked by first associating each word with a vector, called a word embedding. These embeddings are meant to encode a numerical representation of what each word means. Then, if I'm learning a trigram model, I simply concatenate three of these embeddings together and pass them through a neural network. The output of this neural network has a neuron for each of the possible words, which gives us a probability distribution over the next word. Now you may be asking where I even get these word vectors from. To this, I want to talk a little bit about neural networks. Let's say I'm trying to predict if the weather is great for outdoor activity. Maybe I can say that the weather is great if I have high humidity and high temperature. So you can see with this graph here that there is a line I can draw in between the data points that separates the good weather from the bad weather. Lines follow the form wx plus b, where x is the vector containing the two inputs. w is a matrix I'll call the weight matrix, and b is a vector I'll call the bias vector. For notation, I've wrapped this around h, the Heaviside step function, which simply converts a number above the line into a 1, and any number below the line into a 0. So now the goal here is to find the weight matrix w and the bias vector b that's able to separate the data I already have. There are plenty of ways of doing this, and the point of this video isn't really how to explain how this is done. For that, there are a couple of good videos and articles I'll point you to, and I plan on making one eventually. For now, it's fair to assume that we have a good way of computing the best weight matrix and bias vector. Neural networks take this line separation a step further. First, we replace the Heaviside step function with something that's smooth, say the sigmoid function. Then, we're able to layer out our simple classifier many different times. The effect of this is that we're able to divide up the plane into boundaries that can't be represented with a line. But now, we have a whole set of weights and biases to choose from to get the best separation for our plane. The idea behind word embeddings is that I treat them as another weight matrix to choose, where the matrix I'm choosing is just a long list of all the word vectors for each word. Then whatever algorithm I'm using to compute the best weight matrix and best bias vectors also takes in this word embedding matrix to optimize. This neural model worked, but it still suffered from a lot of the problems that n-gram models had. Since we're only considering a small number of words at a time, we lose any long-term dependencies, such as information contained in the previous sentence. Here's an example. 
let's say I'm trying to train a foreground model. Now look at the phrase, the movie is great, and that was great. Without context, the that can pretty much be anything. But there's another problem here. The vector conversion of each of these foregrounds should be somewhat related. After all, both of them are calling something great. But remember how we actually construct the vector given a foregram. We concatenate the word embeddings. The result of this is that the embedding for great is placed in two completely different positions. So there's basically no relation between the two foregrams. The lingo here is that they form orthogonal subspaces. So when it comes to designing a model better than this, I'd probably want to focus on being able to model a lot of the text at once and having some form of uniformity. Language is inherently sequential. Words in a sentence follow each other in a specific order, and the meaning of a sentence depends on this order. In other words, a given word's interpretation depends on all the previous words behind it. The mathematical word for this is called recurrence. Let's see if we can design a recurrent neural network. I'll start by creating what I'll call a recurrent neural network, or RNN cell. Each cell has an input X and an output Y. In addition, each cell has a hidden state. The hidden state is meant to encode some representation of the text so far. The idea is, each cell takes in the hidden state H from the previous cell, updates it with the input X, and passes it on to the next cell. We then examine the output Y of the last hidden cell. In the context of language modeling, I create a cell per unit I'm using, which can be words, letters, or some other way of breaking up text, and we feed it into the input X. The output Y will be a probability distribution across all words, telling me what the most likely next words are. RNNs are great because there's no fixed length for each input. I can feed in as many words as I want. Let's look at one cell. I'll call the previous hidden state ht-1, the input xt, and the output yt. We can compute ht as some transformation to ht-1, plus some transformation to xt, plus some bias term, which is all passed through some nonlinear activation function. The idea here is I'm just combining all the features from the current input and the previous hidden state to get the next hidden state. An important thing to see is that to compute ht, I require ht-1, which requires ht-2, and so on. This is where the recurrent part comes from. We can then compute the output yt as a transformation on ht plus some bias term, which is once again passed through an activation function. The key thing to notice here is that the matrices used to compute all these transformations are the same across each and every cell. Why is this done? Well, remember the example when the word great was used in different places, which caused the input representations to be more different than what we wanted them to be. This uniformity addresses that issue. Now if I input great into an RNN cell, the same transformation is applied no matter what position I put it into. Nice, now we have a better way of modeling the underlying structure within language. We take a lot of text, feed it in chunks into our RNN cells, then compute how well we did, then tweak their matrices accordingly. Let's look at some example output from an RNN language model. The model I'm using is trained on titles from the Apple and Android subreddits. Although I've presented RNNs as predicting the next word, they typically are trained to predict the next letter. But the general idea is still the same. What I want you to notice is that once the model picks the first letter, it gets really confident about the next few, almost as if it knows the word beforehand. But honestly, not bad. It's able to produce coherent sentences. Recurrence-based language models were the cream of the crop until 2016. Google Translate, for example, used an encoder-decoder model based on recurrent neural networks. 
but as great as they were, they suffered from a few problems. The first is that using these models required a sequence of computations that had to be done one after another. There was no room for parallelization or doing things at the same time. To run a cell, we had to compute the previous hidden state, which required computing the one before that, and so on. This recurrent structure was great at modeling how we think about language, but it failed to scale as GPUs got better. And this was the main curse when it came to recurrent neural networks. As amazing as they were, they failed to keep up as our computers got better and better. Another failure of RNNs is that they still fail to capture long-term dependencies. To understand why, it's helpful to talk a little bit about how we actually train RNNs. Let's say I'm trying to train on the sentence, the sky is blue. I feed in the words the sky is and examine what the model outputs for the probability of the next word being blue. If it's a low prediction, I need to update the previous layer such that the probability of blue goes higher. To do that, I need to go to the previous cell and update that, and so on all the way to the beginning. When we consider longer and longer sequences, the updates given by a word that's far away might get lost in the mix. This is such a well-known problem that it's given a fancy name, vanishing gradients. The main problem here is that the structure of the RNN makes it difficult to retain information for long distances. And to this, a different type of cell was used, the LSTM cell. The general idea was to add an additional hidden state, which is the long-term memory, while the other hidden state is the short-term memory. For the long-term memory, we choose to forget and remember certain things from the short-term memory. For this video, I'm going to skip the details, so if you're interested, I can't recommend Chris Ola's blog enough. It does a great job of guiding you through what an LSTM does. Maybe eventually I'll make a short tidbit on it. Today, I introduced to you the idea of a recurrent neural network. The idea was, we created a bunch of identical cells and fed information into each of these cells. Each cell passes over information to the next cell, and so on. In the next video, we'll talk about the attention mechanism and where it comes from. The attention mechanism was used to address a problem of RNNs where they weren't able to hold enough information. Eventually, the attention mechanism gave rise to transformers. So join me in the next video and I'll tell you all about it.